Hi guys, this is Harold again from Beijing. Finally back in my home of choice. And uh, in the sweltering heat of Beijing, it's about 35 degrees. It's not as much as in southern China. I heard in Shanghai it's uh, almost 40 degrees. Plus here uh, in this uh, kind of outskirts of Beijing, it's a bit cooler with a lot of trees. In the shade, it's okay. It's now around uh, 3.30 p.m. So uh, it's the worst time is over, but on the crossroads, it's still very, very hot. Um, so I've been away for uh, uh, like six weeks. Been to Singapore on a business trip. Uh, I got sick in Singapore, luckily not COVID, but I uh, didn't feel well. So for a while I didn't do much videos. I've been following the news. Lots of things happening geopolitically, obviously, uh, still with the war in Ukraine, a topic that I will uh, now address again shortly, what it means for China. Um, then with the US announcing not just one, but two new infrastructure projects to counter Belt and Road. One is the IPEF. I did do a, project, a program on that one. Nobody talks about it, uh, as I predicted. Uh, nobody cares about the IPEF anymore. And um, they announced a new one, which is called um, Partnership for Global Infrastructure. And um, it's kind of a successor for the Build Back Better World, which again, nobody talks anymore. And um, I think that this, this uh, PGI, Partnership for Global Infrastructure, will go down the same road as IPEF and um, Build Back Better World. There's also one from Europe that was called, I think, Blue Dots Network that nobody talks about anymore. So now this uh, global partnership, that's the one from G7. But, you know, whatever the names, whatever <laughs> the big proposal, nothing's going to happen if you don't have a unified political socio-economic system where the leaders of politics do have the power to talk to those who control the economic resources. And that's basically the sickness of the West. Those with the economic resources are pretty much out of the control of those with the political power, which means political power is not much more than a farce. You get to vote, you vote different people into office, but they always do the same things. They don't have the power to change. And those who do have power to change, they don't feel obliged to do anything because they are not officially in charge. So they don't have this moral obligation. You know, like the World Economic Forum people, the big corporation leaders, they're the ones who really have the power. They're the ones who finance the political parties. They're the ones who finance uh, the election processes, the whole campaigns of politicians. Um, but they're not in the spotlight. If people protest, they usually still protest against the police, the government. Uh, so those people who really have the power to change things, those who have the decision-making power to tell the politicians what to do, they're not the target of protests and uh, they don't feel the pressure um, that, you know, they, they really have to change the socio-economic system so that more people benefit from the spoils of the economic development, of the technological progress, etc., etc. Uh, so, yeah, that's my very short <laughs> analysis of the failings of the Western political system, which is uh, opposed to the Chinese alternative, of course, where the political power is on top. Politicians have the power to tell even the biggest corporations, the biggest billionaires, what they have to do in order to bring forward the society and the billionaires have better follow it otherwise they're not going to be billionaires for a long time um, <laughs> always funny to see crocodile tears in western media about those poor uh, chinese billionaires who uh, get you know orders from the communist party well guess what it's a communist party <laughs> they're supposed to to order around billionaires so that they do things for the working people uh, that's uh, the idea of having a communist revolution and a socialist political system. So, yeah, th these are things that have happened. Another thing that's happening, of course, very scary, uh, Nancy Pelosi, the third highest politician in the USA, threatening to visit Taiwan, thereby breaking yet another promise of the US. The US 50 years ago 
solemnly promised uh, in written documents to not have high-level diplomatic exchanges with the Republic of China, that is the political entity on, on Taiwan. They don't care. They don't care about contracts they signed. They don't care about rules. They talk about rules-based orders, but they don't care even about rules that they signed themselves that weren't imposed on them by anyone. So, yeah, this is a very threatening uh, development and um, China is rightfully very angry at the prospect of that visit. By the way, here's another uh, COVID test station behind me. I'm going to do a COVID test in a second. Um, it's free of charge, so you don't have to do it if you don't go to public places, but in public places you have to have one in the last uh, 72 hours, three days. Um, so it's free of charge, you can just do it, uh, so it's not a big deal. Um, but back to Pelosi, I mean, the, the, the thing is that I always ask is, like, in the best of worlds, assuming, you know, politicians aren't liars, assuming politicians work in the interests of the people they, that voted for them, assuming Nancy Pelosi wants to work for global prosperity and peace and for the interests of American people, what would she hope to achieve in Taiwan? Like, what is, in the best of worlds, a thing that would help anyone with her going to Taiwan? I mean, the political situation between China and Taiwan is pretty, you know, chilled. Uh, just spoken to a German friend who went to Taiwan for a year, and he said, you know, Taiwanese, they don't think there will be a war, they don't care about politics, they don't want to have to think about politics, they want the status quo. Same on the mainland, what I see here, I mean, everybody just makes the point, Taiwan cannot stop being part of China, it cannot declare independence, but as long as that bottom line isn't crossed, there's no intention to change anything in the status quo. So what's the need for Nancy Pelosi to interfere in this inner Chinese um, situation? I don't see any upside to this. And that's the thing that I find confusing, like, who's sanctioning these things? Who is honestly sitting there and saying, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. We're getting our backsides whooped by the Russians in Ukraine. We've sent more weapons to Ukraine than the entire annual military budget of Russia. Russia uses a small expeditionary force, that's not even like half their military. And of course, doesn't include all the rents for veterans, etc, etc. So <laughs> that small force has destroyed weapons worth more than the annual budget of the Russian army. Yet Ukraine's still losing. And in that situation, you're going and say, well, we're losing against Russia, which uh, they've said has a GDP the size of Italy or whatnot. And so now you go and say, let's provoke another conflict with China. Like, <laughs> what? Like, where are you going with this? Um, so, yeah, I really don't see the upside, even if it wasn't for pure provocation, even if it wasn't to just, you know, distract from internal conflicts. Like, what is the narrative they want to put out that this would be a good idea? I don't see any. Um, yeah, I'm going to end it here. I want to keep my videos below 10 minutes. Um, I'll do another one soon. And um, let me know what you think. Uh, let me know how, what topics you're most interested. Again, I want to show you the real situation in China. And I will talk about the, the, the alleged bank runs and those economic woos and protests everywhere. That kind of topic in the next video. Bye.